really just want somebody who's going to aggressively fight for me in court. Is that too much to ask? Filing my cases shouldn't be that difficult. There's got to be an easier way. Nothing frustrates me more than having to wait for my attorney to call me back. I need them now. What I really need from my law firm is someone who can provide my staff training so we actually can stay out of trouble. When you have property management problems, we have your solutions. This is the Zona Law Group podcast with the experienced attorneys from Zona Law. And welcome back to the Zona Law podcast. I am Mark Zinman, one of the attorneys with Zona Law. Scott Balua, also with uh, Zona Law. And uh, today we're going to be here talking about some updates that have recently come out as of today's date, September 2nd, 2020, uh, from a recent CDC uh, order. Um, And before we actually begin here, Mark, uh, I think it's important that we let everybody know uh, that it's critically important that you discuss these matters with your counsel, with your attorney, uh, because of the nature of this change that's uh, come out uh, yesterday, September 1st. And, you know, why is it so important that they discuss these with their attorney? Yeah, this may seem like the dark side that we're going to discuss the bad news first but the reason for the disclaimer of course is the cdc just came out with the what they call a national eviction moratorium it's supposed to go into play on uh, the fourth which is the friday what we're talking about here today is based exactly what we're we learned last night what we're reading talking to other attorneys as well uh, but the reason it's important you understand how fluid this is because of how severe the penalties are for a landlord that violates um, this cdc order so i think we'll just call it the order that makes it CDC order, unlike the CARES Act, which had a nice acronym, this is just really referred to as an order. Um, But landlords that violate it are potentially subject to starting at up to 100,000 or all the way up to a half a million dollar penalty, plus up to a year in jail. That is a stiff penalty for violating, which is an eviction moratorium. So any of you out there listening to this, it is crucial that you reach out to your counsel to get uh, the most updated information because today is September 2nd. We only got the order yesterday. There hasn't been any guidance that's been provided by anyone to give us further interpretation of the order. Um, And one of the things to remember here is that this is applying to all properties, correct? Yeah, and that's where we're going to start with this. The, unlike the CARES Act, which just related to federally backed mortgages, this eviction moratorium applies to every single rental property in the entire country. Blanket. That's it. Now, of course, there's always questions of, does it apply to short-term rentals? We don't know. The, the part of the problem is that the language is very unclear. It talks about motels and hotels and guest housing being exempted from this order, but we don't know if that means does that apply to Airbnb? Does it apply to you know someone that comes in for just a, a monthly rental or a weekly rental? We don't know. Yeah, and for the more... So we'll talk in the general terms here today to go to the bulk of our clients if you represent you know, or own a multifamily property or a manufactured home community, the standard rentals. That's what we're talking about. And this order does apply to all of those across the board. And basically what it does, it says a landlord can't take an action to evict somebody from a property in one of those cases if the resident completes a declaration and turns it into the landlord. So, of course, the question is, what's in the declaration? Well, there's five different components that are uh, in the uh, the declaration. Uh, essentially, the tenant has to, uh, under penalty of perjury, attest that they are um, that they've lost work, uh, that they have been direct, that they've been affected by COVID nineteen in some way, that their income is below ninety nine thousand dollars or one hundred ninety eight thousand dollars if filing uh, jointly and married. Uh, so there's all these different things that you have to put into the declaration. The CDC hasn't given us exact guidance. It, the language is clear, but they don't require a form. So the the form could be somewhat flexible as long as it has those five elements in it. Yeah, and we're obviously hoping that you know. This is going to get out. We've This came out about 12 hours ago, and we're already seeing tenants claiming that they've completed the declaration and given it to their landlord. So we're hoping that they actually use the form from the CDC because then it would make it easy. Either you completed the form or you didn't. The biggest question we're getting from clients now, though, is can they challenge the f- information in the form? I mean, the only, all of the questions, really the five things, most of them are like, are you acting in good faith? That's what they come down to. Right. Except the one that's a black or white is, do you expect to make $99,000 this year in 2020 or uh, 200000 if you're married filing jointly? The CDC order does not allow a landlord to challenge that. If it is signed by the tenant, this tenant may be liable for perjury. The DOJ could pass, potentially investigate that tenant. But 
the landlord can't go into the eviction as far as we can tell so far and challenge it and to proceed with the eviction. Once the tenant signs the declaration, they've completed it, right? That is correct. It, it, if if there's no mechanism to challenge it, it it's almost irrelevant whether or not uh, the statements that are made in the declaration are accurate because you as the landlord don't have the power to do anything about it. You could know for certain, because we're certainly going to be getting these questions, where the landlord is aware of information that is contradictory to what is in the declaration, and they're going to ask that question, and we're going to say, well, sorry, maybe you reported to the Department of Justice, but as far as stopping the eviction action to prevent them from being considered a covered person, that's it's we're not going to get anywhere yeah and that's how it's figured so if remember under the cares act you had to figure out whether there was a federally backed mortgage which means you have to have some idea of the deed of trust and the loan here it really looks to the covered person which is have they signed the declaration and do they fall under that and once they've signed you have to assume they fall under that and so what does that apply to then so the case is the way it's written this stops an act to evict a resident for non-payment of rent what about non-compliance is what about immediate so if there's a criminal activity if there's something that's affecting the health and welfare uh, well, health and safety of other tenants in the community uh, if there's severe property damage going on essentially if there are breaches of the lease agreement you can still move forward and it's fairly clear from the how the order is written that uh, that is the intent is to cover simply the non-payment of rent one of the gray areas that we would have on the order is with regards to the non-renewal. Uh, you know, we could certainly make the argument that if you have uh, a contractual obligation to vacate by the end of October, you serve the appropriate notice. It's a breach of the lease if you stay in there past that vacate notice. But we're not sure. And the question becomes, do you want to be the test case in serving one of those notices and then pursuing an eviction for it? And it may be a violation of the order. Yeah, and we're going to be trying as, as best we can to reach either the CDC or other, any other avenues that we can get the directions on these types of questions because it prohibits the eviction on a non-payment, um, which obviously is different from our perspective on a non-renewal. But again, this is what happened similar with the CARES Act when we're starting to address landlord-tenant issues, which are state issues on a federal scale. There's a lot more uncertainty and a lot more gray area. And for us, one, education is key, and two, being conservative and complying with the law. You don't want to risk the potential penalties that there are out there. Um, so the question is now what we're getting, even this morning starting at about 6 a.m., the emails we started getting was, what do they do? Well, first off, the law doesn't, the order doesn't take place until Friday. So we have cases that are being filed right now um, because one, it doesn't apply, and two, the landlords don't have the declaration. What happens in, though, before we get to court next week, if the tenant shows up and gives the declaration? What do you think? Ah, that that creates a, another problem. If the eviction action has already been filed, we have good arguments to say that, well, the judgment should still be entered. It's just that the landlord would now be prohibited from requesting the writ of restitution, the document that authorizes the return of the possessions of the landlord. Um, if you've received the declaration before the eviction action has even been filed, that's where you're going to have to consult your attorney because we're still trying to get guidance on what it is that we should do in that circumstance. Uh, because the declaration is what causes the tenant to become a covered person and to invoke those protections under the order. If they don't do that, then it's fair game to proceed forward with notices, fair game to proceed forward on an eviction, and even with the writ of restitution. Yeah, so nothing applies until the person completes that declaration and gets it into the landlord. And for us, we're going to have clients, you know, basically attest to us in writing that they have not gotten that information if they want to go through the process. But we cannot stress this enough. If you've started the process, whether you've served a notice, maybe you've filed your case, any time before the writ is executed, if you get that declaration in, you need to contact your attorney to figure out really what the right answer is moving forward. There's an argument you can proceed to get a judgment, but not the writ. But there's also an argument that case has to be dismissed. And we're really hoping to get that direction from the CDC, which we don't have yet. And, you know, we love to make arguments. We're attorneys. That is our job. But again, we have to, clients have to understand there's a lot of risk that goes along with this. All right, we're one day out from the order coming out. Everybody's still trying to digest it. We don't know where we're going to get direction from. It's likely that the justice courts are going to issue some type of direction. We may get uh, direction from the Arizona Supreme Court. We may get direction directly from the CDC with a, with a Q&A. Uh, but right now, it's an ever-changing uh, landscape that we're going to have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And Which probably means we're probably going to do a podcast over the weekend, let's be honest. Um, so for now, until the order obviously applies, hopefully it'll, we believe it's going to kick in and start to be effective on the 4th, 
proceed as you always would until you get a declaration from your tenant. At that point, contact your attorney and really go over the specifics at that point of what the information they have, what direction we were getting from all the different agencies as to what rights you have and going forward. Right, because what's uh, accurate and true today may not be tomorrow as we get more information. Yeah, and to, to answer also the multi-million dollar question that we're getting, is this even constitutional? Um, this issue came out of the CDC, which is obviously part of the executive branch, stopping evictions. People are making the argument that it really should have gone through the legislative branch. Um, again, I, I've got my, as an attorney, I've got my opinion on those. You may as well. But until, if somebody challenges and it goes through courts, it'll probably end up at the Supreme Court. Until that is done, you must comply with it. And that's all that matters. To me, we can argue back and forth the constitutionality, but while the penalties are out there, you comply. Exactly. It is a challenge for the landlords, and it's challenging for us because we look at the plain language of the order and we try to refer back to how the CDC is devising how the to be able to do this, and we can't connect the dots. So if we're having that difficulty, you know, that's what's going to make it more frustrating for the landlords and for there to be some type of resolution for this. Yeah, and we probably didn't say it before, but this eviction moratorium goes through all the way the end of this year. And I guarantee we'll have another podcast well before that to update you on all the different changes. So until next time, thank you so much for joining us here on the Zone of Law podcast. Thank you.